Okay, so in this tutorial, we're going to pick up our discussion on work to energy. Uh, during class, we were discussing how when you do work and there are no other forces present, all the work goes towards giving an object an energy of motion, in other words, kinetic energy, and that can be calculated as 1 half mv squared. So we're going to look at two other cases here where there are opposing forces, but they're of different nature. Okay, so pay close attention to the details, but we'll, we'll summarize in class and we'll do some practice problems in class. This is pretty straightforward. So the first uh, case we want to do is work against a conservative force. Okay, and a conservative force, all right, not a political conservative, but it's any force that tries to bring the object back to its original position. Okay, and there are two such forces that we're going to look at. One right now and another one later. One force is when you do work against gravity. In other words, by lifting something up. Gravity wants to bring it back down. Another one that we'll look at is when you do work against springs. Okay, if you stretch or compress a spring, the spring will go back to its original position uh, when you let it go. So when you do work against that and you just let it go, you just hold it in place, in other words, you bring something to the top of a table and you set it there, or you stretch a spring and you hold it there, there's no kinetic energy per se. Um, it's not moving, but it has energy because you're working against conservative force and it goes towards potential energy. Okay, so potential energy, and there are many forms of them, we're just talking about two, um, is essentially an energy of position. You put an object in a position where the it wants to go back to the original position because of some restoring force. And, but because it's potential, it's stored. It can be used some time later, maybe a day, a year, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, but it's there. So we want to understand how to calculate that potential energy. All right, so it's pretty straightforward for gravity. So if our force is gravity, okay, then we're going to talk about a potential energy PE, and we're going to put a little G there to understand it's gravitational potential energy as opposed to spring energy. So we've kind of redone really this before. We're just going to look at a different context. So let's say I have a mass that's at the bottom ramp, and I want to either lift it straight up or I want to move it along the ramp. And I want to know how much energy we give it to raise it from one height to another height. Okay, so to lift it straight up, the first situation is pretty easy. Our work is force of gravity times a distance, and the distance is h. And so, how do we calculate it? It's simply mgh. Right? We've done that before. Because we had to do that much work, it now has a potential energy of mgh. Well, what if we want to push it up along the ramp? Well, we said before that the work done would be the parallel component of the weight times the distance d. Well, how do they compare? And, and, I'm sorry, and this is equal to mg sine theta times d because w parallel is mg sine theta. Well, if we use a little trick, we see that h, and I'm not going to rederive it, this is theta, is going to be d sine theta. And if we substitute it into the uh, equation that we had before, Okay, we had W lift was MGH, and if H is D sine theta, that's equal to MG D sine theta, which is the same as above. So the point I'm trying to make is it doesn't matter whether we go along the ramp or go straight up, our potential energy is the same. And that's wonderful. And if we take this curved path here, even though we don't know the force or necessarily the distance, what matters is the height to which we go. Okay, so a very important point about potential energy. Work done to raise an object to different height is independent. Of the path taken. Okay, so we can raise it straight up, we can use a ramp, we can use a curve, we can use stairs, anything. What matters is our beginning height and our end height. So our equation for potential energy gravitational is very simple. It's the mass, the weight of the object, times the height to which we raise it. And perhaps a better way of looking at it is any change in potential energy gravitational is mg delta h. So it's really the change in height that matters. Okay, so let's do a simple little problem. Okay, so let's say we take an elevator to a height of five meters and uh, JJ and his wheelchair have a total mass of 70 kilograms. How much gravitational potential energy do we have? So let's first establish why there's gravitational potential energy. So JJ did move from the one floor to another, but when he gets off, he doesn't have, if he's just sitting there, he doesn't have any kinetic energy. 
All right, so he didn't gain any connected to the elevator. What he gained was potential because he was lifted up, and he was the applied force in the elevator was uh, being opposed by gravity. So to calculate the gravitational potential on you, pretty straightforward. You take his mass, you take it, multiply it by g, and you do, do the change in height. Okay, so I'm going to use 10 for g just for argument's sake to make my life easier with a calculator. So we have 70 milligrams times 10 meters per second squared. And by the way, any props, you should use 9.8 times 5 meters. Okay, so that's 700 times 5. We have 3,500. And since we're dealing with energy, it's going to be joules. We could put Newton meters. So he has that amount of energy. Now let's say he decides to roll back down along a spiral ramp. Okay, and that ramp is, since it's a spiral, it's going to be 30 meters just to drop 5 meters of height. And we want to know what's the change in potential energy here. Okay, so the temptation is to use this 30 as our length. But we don't have to, because the change in potential energy going back down has nothing to do with the path he takes. It's simply equal to mg delta h. So his mg is still 70 times 10, or 700 newtons, and our change in height is, well, negative 5 meters. So that's negative 3,500 joules. So in going up, he gained 3,500 joules. And going down, he lost the 3,500 joules. And the beauty of both these calculations, it doesn't matter what path he took. All that matters is the change of height. All right. And if our conservative force is elastic, and I mentioned this earlier, we will talk about uh, spring potential energy. But that's not for now. All right. So the last type of situation we want us to understand is when we do work against non-conservative forces. Okay, non-conservative force is, it's not the best definition, but it works for us. It does not bring the object back. Okay, and the classic example of a force that would oppose you, but if you let go, it doesn't bring it back, is friction. Okay, or drag. Okay, so what kind of energy do you get when you have friction or drag opposing you? We mentioned this before, we get thermal energy. So the work that you do goes to thermal energy, and we're going to give the uh, symbol for thermal energy a U. Okay, so let's look at a simple, and, and by the way, the equation for U is simply the force of friction multiplied by whatever distance over which it acts. Okay, it's really just a work equation, so we don't have a special equation for it, so you're not going to see it on your reference table. So, a simple example, a 30 kilogram box is opposed by a force of 40 newtons, so that's going to be the force of friction over a distance of 3 meters. There's our D. How much work is done by friction? Well, that's pretty easy. So the work for work done by friction is going to be 40 newtons times 3.4 meters, and that, of course, is 120 joules. How much internal energy is generated? That's well, easy. The amount of internal energy generated is equal to the work done by friction, which is 120 joules. Okay? Now, let's look at how this can be used. In order to slide the box up a ramp that is 2 meters high, 700 joules of work must be done. How much energy is lost to Q? Well, I guess maybe uh, I'll call it U. We'll talk about that in class. I can't remember whether I want to use U or Q. All right, so the work done on the box overall when we go up the ramp is equal to the work done against gravity plus the work done against by friction. Okay, we just calculated the amount of work that is going to pose us with friction based on the uh, situation. So we just have to calculate the work done by gravity. Well, how do we calculate the work done by gravity? Well, that sounds like, really, the work done on the box goes towards potential energy, gravitational, plus any thermal energy we get. So that's going to be mgh, okay, plus whatever u that we calculated before. So we have, uh, oh, my bad, I'm sorry, this is a different situation. Okay, it's the same situ or same equation. Uh, so we know that our total work is 700. So we have 700, okay, equals our mgh plus u. We don't know u, so it's not the same u as the prior problem. 
So what is our MGH? Okay, so we're going to say M is, uh, we already know that it's MG is 40 newtons, right? And the height is 2 meters plus U. So 40 times 2 is 80. So we had 700 joules of work done just to give it 80 newtons of, oh my goodness, I did that up. So mg is going to be 30 times, we'll use 10 again, plus u. So this is 300. So what's left over is we have 400 joules of energy was lost to uh, thermal. We only got 300 joules of potential for our input of 700. So that's our introduction to the three types of energy that we're interested in at this juncture. And then we'll talk in class, a very, very important concept of the law of conservation of energy, where we put this all together.